This program starts in 10 minutes.
Film starts in five minutes. program starts in 2 minutes program starts now
Hello everyone. This is Swati Mahanti. A warm welcome once again to Hyderabad Runners weekly webinar series Beyond the Track. We hope you are taking all measures to stay safe and healthy. Hyderabad Runners promotes running, fitness and active lifestyles through its thousands of volunteers, mentors and ambassadors. Couch to 5K, club run, how to kids, train and shine, kids run and our signature Airtel Hyderabad Marathon AHM are just few of our initiatives. In our endeavor to keep you constantly aware and educated, we bring you Beyond the Track, a one hour live webinar series of conversations with some of our highly distinguished experts from running and sports world to help you all equip with both theoretical knowledge and practical training. In this 33rd episode of Beyond the Track, we are honored to connect you to Mr. Raymond Perrin the Global Commercial Director, Active Sports, MyLabs Sports Timing. As we endeavor to create a smooth learning experience for you all, continue to post your questions to Mr. Raymond Perrin in the comment section. Our own Mr. Dhiris Taneja is an active member of Altravad Runners and will be interacting with our guests and facilitating today's sessions for us all. Without any further ado, I would like to invite him to introduce and welcome our speaker for today. Welcome, over to you, Dhiraj. Thank you, Swati. So runners, have you ever wondered that what is the function of that small piece of foam that is found on the timing chip uh, at the back of your bib, the disposable timing chip? Uh, well, also that the company that uh, does timing for our very own AHM and for most of the world marathon majors is also doing the timing technology for the Formula One racing. Well, today's webinar is ev everything we can, we can think about timing, how the technology behind it, what goes on. So the, this company is MyLabs and Mr. Raymond Perrin is the global director for uh, global commercial director active sports for My MyLabs. And uh, this MyLabs, it not only provides technology for the active sports, but also provides technology for say sports like ice skating, even for MotoGP, well, most of the Olympics uh, that involve timing. Uh, a, a bit about Mr. Raymond Perrin, uh, he started his career with championships in 2006. Uh, at that time, championships was in a startup phase. Uh, it was actually working on a GPS based tracking project, which, which never went through to the final stages. But uh, then this company transformed into MyLabs as we know today. He has gone through various roles within the organization. In fact, uh, a lot of veteran runners might remember championship uh, by that circular plastic timing chip that we used to, it was not disposable. We had to kind of return that at the end of the race and we used to tie that to our shoelaces. So it's the same company championship. He has lived for, Mr. Raymond has lived for about seven years in Asia Pacific. He has been responsible for setting up the MyLabs official offices in, in Malaysia and China. He also uh, worked in Sydney for three plus years, setting up offices there. Now he's back in Kuala Lumpur and um, he's, he will be moving back to Netherlands, uh, in fact, next week. Uh, he has been involved in a lot of different races, uh, both active sports and motorized sports in every continent of the world. He has seen small community races uh, where MyLabs was involved, plus the large races where uh, the world records were broken. Uh, right, Presently, he's in the role of a global commercial director, Active Sports. He's responsible for the worldwide business in Active Sports for MyLabs. Now, without, without further ado, I'll uh, we'll, let's move to Raymond's presentation. Over to you, Raymond. Thank you so much. And, and also, thank you um, that I am able to, uh, to be in very close touch now with uh, the Indian and the, and the Hyderabad running community. It's, uh, it's really a long time uh, ago that I was in, uh, in Hyderabad. Actually, I still have a photo of that uh, on this slide. Struggling a bit, uh, running uh, a 10 kilometer after a long, long, long time. Uh, so good to be back, uh, although it's virtual. So let's, uh, let's go through the content of this presentation. So first of all, I would like to uh, explain you a little bit more about uh, the history of my labs. Um, after that, I will go to a, a bit of history of, of timing and the timing technology we are using in, uh, in Reading. And I will also deep dive a bit more into really the technology, so, so how it works. Uh, and then uh, at, in, in the end of this presentation, I would like to uh, yeah, give you a little bit of insight on, on what we think is, uh, is going to happen uh, next in, uh, in, in timing. 
And please ask as much questions uh, as you have on, on, uh, on, on timing um, so that we can answer them in the, in the Q&A session uh, at the end. Uh, so first of all, uh, a little introduction about MyLabs. Uh, as uh, you just heard, uh, when you run a, a race in India, a lot of races, when you take a look at the back of your start number, there is the name, uh, the name MyLabs. Uh, so what do we do? So we are trying to support you racers and athletes uh, and also events and sponsors to make sure that you all have your ultimate sports experience. Uh, every year, we, we think we time about uh, 20 million people which is really a lot of people all over the world. It's, it's not us timing that, but it's our partners who are timing that. Uh, and we try to give, uh, to give you more insight in, in the timing and in, in all kinds of things, progress and fun. Uh, the company started in 1982. And since then, uh, yeah, we really uh, changed the world of sports timing. And one of our core values is really innovation we are trying to set the standard every time and or continuously. Yeah. So for us, research and development is really a big part also of the company. Yeah. If you look into the events uh, which are using our technology, then you will see really large events like the Olympic Games, the Ironman, the MotoGP, uh, large running events like the, like the Hong Kong Marathon, the Chicago Marathon, Berlin Marathon. But we also do a lot in the very small races uh, everywhere in the world. So it's not only the big races, but also uh, smaller races. So as said before, the company started in 1982, and it might be starting a bit in a, a world which you might not be familiar with, because it started in radio controlled car racing. Yes, that is a very serious sport and very competitive. And two brothers, um, they founded the company A and B because they had a problem. Every time after a radio control car race, there was a bit of a fight who won the race because there was nothing automatically done at that time. It were always people counting the laps of the cars which went around. So these two brothers thought, okay, let's automate that. So what you see here is the first timing system, the first automatic timing system, the A and B 8100. Probably they start developing that in 1981. Uh, that's where the number comes from. And what you see is an, uh, about 10 buttons here. And how it worked was every time a car passed, the, somebody typed in the number on the car. As you can see, there's a number on the car. So number four, then you type in number four. And then the next car comes, number 10, you type in number 10. And the moment you type in the number, the time is recorded. Uh, well, that is not really automated. So they figured out very quickly that that was not really the way to do automated timing. So then they continued their developments and they uh, started with so-called transponders. So what you see in the left picture is uh, uh, here red transponders. There's a little battery inside. You put a wire on the road and with some kind of frequency tricks, every time when a little car passes the, the, uh, that wire, the antenna, then they captured the time. So they started with, off with, uh, with, radio control, uh, with radio control cars, so the small cars. And after two races, uh, the big boys of Formula One came to them and they said, hey, this is really interesting, this technology you have, but it's for small cars. We have a little bit bigger cars. Can you maybe develop this technology and give it to us? Because we also really would like to have that. Uh, everyone really saw a big advantage in that. But these two brothers, they always uh, had the vision of a small little family company, and they were not really eager to go in this very commercial world where uh, yeah, it's, it's really about commercial and, and pressure, and they didn't really like that. So they said, oh, we are very sorry, but we really would like to focus on the small cars because that's our hobby. Yeah. A couple of years later, uh, they changed their mind a bit because they figured out that radio control car racing is not that big in the world. So uh, since that moment, uh, basically all those uh, F1 races and uh, numerous more uh, car races were timed with MyLabs, but you will never see our name there because uh, we have the watch brands like the Rolex or Citizen or Seiko, and they sell the watches to consumers. They want the name in the screen. So they pay the Formula One and the MotoGP uh, quite some money. Uh, and then they get the name in the screen. We as MyLabs, we don't sell watches. So for us to put our name in the screen of a Formula One race 
does not make sense at all. Uh, it, our business is basically timing systems and not selling watches. Uh, so this AMB company, this was one company in the Netherlands, but there was another company and that was called Championship, which was started in 1993. And as I was told before, you might recognize this, uh, this yellow chip. A uh, few students were timing a running race in the Netherlands, organizing that called Seven Hills Run. And that race became bigger and bigger and bigger. And timing that manually, yeah, that really became a very big hassle. Uh, so they, they figured out the system and they called it championship. And that was very, very successful. And actually, in, in opposite of the A and B people, they were timing the Boston Marathon uh, just uh, uh, yeah, a few years later uh, already. And they said yes to the big event. Uh, well, two companies, both in timing uh, business, one in motorized business, one in active sports business and both in the Netherlands. Uh, so a, a big investment company, the largest in the Netherlands, Hall Invest, they uh, bought both of the companies and they merged it in 2008 into MyLabs. Uh, a lot of people still recognize and call us with the name A and B, while we already changed 12 years ago, or even longer, but yeah, they still, uh, they still use that old name. It's really hard to change a brand, the same for championship. Uh, what you see here is a bit of our roadmap for, for motorized and for active sports. And you see every couple of years, new innovations. And that is what really is important for us. Make sure that we keep on top of it. Make sure that we keep on innovating and think of new products. And I will get back to some of those a little bit later on. Of course, when you make a, a, a timing technologies, then uh, you also are in uh, races where records are broken world records, a lot of world records for, for marathons, uh, 15 kilometers, half marathons, 10 kilometers all over the world. And every time a world record is broken, please look at the ground and you will see a red mats or black mats with our logo on it. And always interesting and we are always proud when there's a new world record with our uh, equipment. Uh, actually, if you are watching on the 6th of December, there is another uh, world record attempt, the Valencia Marathon and Half Marathon. I put a link here in the QR code, you can scan it and then you can uh, take a look at that race. And what you see here is that there is really a strong elite field hired by the organizer to try to break the world record for both the, uh, the half marathon and the marathon. Uh, and these are the half marathon times of guys running 58, uh, 59 minutes for half a marathon. I'm not doing that, but uh, yeah, these guys really can do that and, and break, the, uh, break the world record. And if they do, we always come back on Monday to the office with a big smile. So our products are um, for professional athletes and racers. Uh, so Usain Bolt runs with, uh, with, with our chip, uh, cyclists do that, ice skaters, motocrossers, uh, MotoGP guys and car racers. But as I already said, uh, also we have technologies for everybody else who wants to feel like a champion. Uh, and so if you are racing in your cart here, uh, you can be your personal best can be published uh, wherever you want. If you're running a marathon, you, you can show that to your friends uh, yeah, because everybody wants to feel like a, like a champion, right? So for my labs, it's also very important to be close to that customer. So, so that's why we have a number of our own offices uh, everywhere in each continent. Uh, and so we have offices in Australia, in Kuala Lumpur, in Japan, in China, in the Middle East, in the Netherlands, where our headquarters is, and also in North and South America. So for us, super important. But next to this network of our own offices, we have much more partners in the world. And all these partners, they work with our equipment. They use our equipment from day to day, most of the times in the weekends, of course. And they time the races with that. So we need to make sure that this equipment always works is very user friendly and that as much people as possible can use it. Uh, all right, so this was a, a small introduction of our company. Uh, let's take a little bit uh, a more in depth look into the timing in running. Uh, so I guess you all uh, can uh, see this, uh, this little stopwatch. This is how this was done in the beginning. Uh, just pressing a button on the stopwatch and see what time somebody passes quite inaccurate um, analog in the beginning. Later on, it became di digital right, with the, the digital stopwatches. But for the bigger running races, it's really hard to understand them when you do the stopwatch, who is finishing. 
and first, second, and third. And maybe after 100, because when you're finishing in the 100th position, you still would like to uh, have that acknowledged somewhere around. So in the past, they used this pin system. So how did that work? So you had a bib, you put it on your chest, you run the race. As soon as you finish, somebody tears off a part of your bib and put it on the pin. And they did it with all the participants. So in the end, you got a whole stack with pins. Basically, then you have the order because the person on the bottom is the first, and then it goes up, 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 up. However, you also would like to have the time of the person. So that's where they introduced this little uh, printer where every time you press a button, it prints a time. And then you have 100 times. You match that with these 100 parts of the bibs, and you have a result. The only thing is that with the bigger races, it takes about two to three days to get the result and print it afterwards in the newspaper. That is how it worked in the past. So that uh, became a challenge uh, for, for the bigger races, like, for example, the Seven Hills Run in the Netherlands, where thousands of people were running. Yeah. So then my next picture, you see uh, some cattle here, and they all have an earmark. Because in the time the championship was starting, all the cattle in Europe, it had to be marked with an earmark. And in that earmark, there was a little chip, a transponder, a Texas Instruments transponder. So those students in the Netherlands organizing this running race, one of them, their father had a, uh, a farm, and he was thinking, if you can earmark all this cattle, then maybe you can also earmark runners. And this is how the championship started, how it uh, became a product. So this, this little transponder is here in the chip. So next to this transponder, you will have to have some equipment to receive the signals of this transponder. So what you see in this picture, you see the finish line of the, of the Berlin Marathon. They are still using this championship system. And you see the mats here. And these mats are the antennas of the system. These mats are connected to a yellow box, which they very professionally hide here in a blue box, because that looks better on the starting arc. So you see this yellow box here. And this is, yeah, we call this the decoder, the receiver, whatever you want to call it. So you run with your chip on the antenna, and the box receives it. You connect it to a, uh, to a laptop, and you get uh, transponder numbers and times out of that. Uh. So these were the basics. The chips at that time were reusable. So what does that mean? That at the finish line, when you have a 10,000 participant race, somebody needs to cut off 10,000 shoelaces to get these chips back. And because it's a reusable system, the organizer didn't want to pay too much money, so the timer takes back all these chips there. So for the bigger events, this became really a hassle because events are growing and growing and growing. And to take back 73,000 chips in the Hong Kong Marathon, yeah, you need a lot of people for that. And you need also, as an event organizer, you want to keep the flow going of your, of your participants. So you want to get them out of the finish area as soon as they finish there. So taking off a chip is delaying that. So at that time, then, Championship introduced a disposable chip. That uh, looks like this. And it had a lot of copper inside. So this also means that this disposable chip, yes, it's cheaper than a reusable chip. But it's still not very cheap because it has a lot of copper and an expensive chip on there. So around that time, uh, there were uh, some other companies uh, thinking about a different technology, a UHF technology, a high frequency technology. So what you see here is a, a shoe tag. It's a UHF chip, which was put on the shoe. At that time, uh, also uh, next to these competitors, a championship was also looking into other ways because what Championship wanted was not timing on the shoe, but timing on the bib, because the, the torso is the official finish time. And when you pass the finish, your, your time is officially measured when you pass with your chest. So that is where we, in 2010, introduced uh, a disposable bib tag. So that is the, the sticker um, which you put on the start number. There's a foam on it, and there's a chip code in this chip, which, um, yeah, gives uh, you a finish time when you pass the mat. One thing was, uh, what, what was a little bit annoying is that these chips were quite thick because of the foam. And I will explain you a little bit later why that foam is, uh, but it is there for a spe specific reason. Uh, um, yeah, this, um, this, and th this foam, we thought, OK, how can we make this better? So what we nowadays put on the chip is a sponge. 
a little sponge, which is normally flat when you're not sweating, when it's not raining, it's super, super flat. It stick on your bib, nothing is happening. But when you start sweating a lot, it's a sponge, it absorbs water. So the sponge will expand a little bit and create a distance between the chip and your body. And why is that so important? Well, that has all to do with the UHF technology, which we are using. UHF stands for ultra high frequency. And that means if you would put a chip in the middle of a glass of water, a UHF chip, it will not read because water is blocking the UHF signal. Your body is about 70 to 80% of water. So you, that is why this foam spacer is there to create a distance between your body and the chip so that it detects the best. So that is why you have that foam and nowadays the sponge which will automatically expand. Uh, um, the technology is a, is a passive technology and that basically means your chip needs to be activated. And there is no battery in it, so it's never on, unless you are passing our mats. So what are, are the mats doing here? The mats are basically charging the chip. Then as you are passing, the chip will start sending out the number back to the mat, and then the mat will send it back to the decoder, which is next to the mat in this picture on the right side. And there is where your uh, result is stored. So passive technology, um, no battery, the chip needs to be activated, which the green lines are doing, and then it sends back the, the chip code. Uh, so we also do have active technologies and active chips, and the big difference is the battery and the, the, the chip inside. Uh, another uh, thing here is what you see here is, uh, is ice skating. In ice skating, we need to be super, super accurate uh, it needs to be very, uh, very high precision. So with passive, we normally get about one tenth of a second. With active technology uh, in the Formula One cars, we get one ten thousandth of a second. Uh, most of our active technologies, they do not work with a mat. Uh, if you want to ice skate, it's not really practical to ice skate on top of a mat. Um, so we put a wire in the ice or in the ground or in the tarmac. So there is a, a wire in there. Uh, so now when you have watched, for example, ice skating, there are a, a lot of other timing technologies which are used in these sports. Uh, one of the timing technologies used a lot in sports is a photocell technology. So what does that, uh, how does that work? I'm, I'm not sure if you sometimes enter a store and you hear this ding dong bell, then probably you have passed a photocell without knowing it. So there is a little laser beam going from the left side to the right side. On the right side, there's a little mirror that reflects the laser beam back to the photocell on the left side. And as soon as something goes through that, to, to that line, the, 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 the beam, the laser beam does not come back. So the photocell recognizes that and says, hey, somebody passed here at this moment. Uh, so yes, now you hear it correctly. It says somebody passed at this moment which basically means that you have no idea who it is. And it can be the first one, it can be the second one, but you don't know who it is. And that is a big difference with transponder technology. And the transponder technology or the chip technology also sends the code of the chip to the system, while the photocell only detects when something goes through it. So this photocell can be really good use for, for sports where there's only one participant in the track, but it is harder to use for sports where there are more than one participants in the track. Yeah. So the other uh, technology uh, which is used a lot is the finish line camera, also known as photo finish. So how does that work? So at the finish line, you put a camera, but it's not a normal camera. It's a very special camera. The camera takes one little pixel line and it does that depending on the, on the frequency of the camera. It does that in, in Formula One 10,000 times in one second. In running uh, and, and cycling very often, it's 2,000 times in one second. So 2,000 times, it takes one pixel line every time of a, of a place, the start or the finish line. And then you get these beautiful pictures, as you can see here. And this is super, super, uh, yeah, you can make this very, very accurate uh, until one ten thousandth of a second where you have 10,000 lines per second. Uh, the only disadvantage of this technology is that it 
takes a little bit of time to see who was passing that line at that moment. Uh, and you need to count how many lanes were in this photo to realize that this person on the bottom fell first through the finish line there. And then the person on the top was second. I'm actually in this case not 100% sure who won the race because uh, yeah, I, I would say the person will fall, but I'm not sure about uh, these regulations. So these are two, uh, two other timing technologies, which are, for example, used in the Olympic Games um, to, to make sure that all the results are accurate. Uh, so during Olympic Games, when you have, for example, uh, the marathon or the, or the half marathon or, or those kind of distances, longer distances, what they very often do is they use the transponder uh, technology next to the photo finish technology. So how does that work? When the, the participants are too close together, then they will not display the transponder technology in your screen, but they will put photo finish, photo finish. And then the timer will take a little bit of time to figure out who was really the first one. There. Transponders are very accurate, um, but yeah, sometimes you really need the photo finish to, to make it that 100% that accurate. Uh, so for you as a runner, what uh, is important when you are using a timing system uh, with a bib tag? Uh, and the chip is, uh, is, is at the back of your bib. And the chip is super, super small. And there are some antennas on the side. And so it is important to have this bib always in front of you and not at the back of your shirt. Why not? Why not at the back? A lot of runners, they run a little bit forward, or they bend a little bit forward. If the bib would be on the back of your shirt, that means that there is a whole body in between. And I just explained to you before that your body is a lot of water. And this UHF technology does not really like to go through water. So if you put the bib on your back, there is a, a little bit of a chance that you will not be detected by the timing system. So that is the first one. Uh, reason why you should put it in the front. When you put it in the front, make sure you put it nicely eh, and, and pin it in all the four corners so you don't lose it. But also don't put your, your belt on top of it with water bottles, water again, because it's uh, blocking the signal. And also don't put a jacket on top of your chip because that can make the detection make less good. And maybe you will be missed. It's not happening a lot. But what we see a lot when we put a video camera at the finish as well, we see the people we, we do not detect are wearing a jacket or putting a belt in front of their bib number. Don't do that. Uh, and last, yeah, don't uh, wrinkle your whole bib. Uh, don't make it a small uh, little uh, piece of paper because it is a chip, it is electronics, it can break when you're not uh, handling it nicely. Uh, so these are some tips for you as a runner to make sure that you will always get an accurate finish time. So what do we see right now at this moment? And what are the, the, the trends I see in the market? Uh, so while in, uh, in 1982, timing was very unique, at this moment, it's not unique anymore. There is no, uh, if there is no timing, then there is basically not really a race or an event, right? You guys, uh, you, you expect timing at the race. Uh, so the timing is a given. But what we see is that uh, we see an increase of the data needs of you as a runner. And you all see these kind of pictures from your, from your watch. Uh, last uh, Friday, we did a, a trail walk uh, with the office. And my watch, it's just a simple watch. It keeps all kind of data here. My heart rate, the distance, uh, how many height meters I did. And I really like that. It's really cool to, to have this. Uh, you see that also in the motorized sports. So, so similar, similar thing. A lot of, um, yeah, a lot of those um, ex additional information, like the speed, which gear is this person in, uh, how fast is he going. So, and and that is actually uh, basically where, what we are also working on at this moment, and what we are putting in the in the motorized market at this moment, is that we add a two-way communication in our chips. So we are able to send back data of the of the athlete back to the timing system to do something else with that. Uh, um, another thing uh, is also that the sponsor really likes the data. And when you look at the picture on the left side, uh, you see uh, uh, this is called a brand scan, how we call it. So we put a camera somewhere 
and we analyze uh, what kind of shoes you're wearing, which brand it is, and we can also connect that to the to the registration data. And we can say, okay, 73% of the of the of this race was male, and of this 73%, uh, 50% of these male people they all wear Essex shoes, and and the, with the female, the Saucony shoe is more popular. <laughs> Super interesting information for the sponsor of the of the event. So data is uh, yeah what what we see. Another thing uh, what we see is that uh, you guys and and everybody in this world loves to share stuff. Uh, you you do a run and you really want to show it to everybody in the world, preferably immediately after you finish. You would like to have a selfie with your finish time in that. And this is already possible with technology at this moment. Uh, for, we, we created, uh, we call that an event app for events, where you can take some athlete uh, data here, but you can also, when you finish the race, you can make a selfie and your finish time is in your selfie app. So you can immediately post this on your social media and, and all these kind of things. So people like to share. So we are trying to, to, to do something with that and to, uh, yeah, to put that, it has a little bit of a link with timing, so that's why we're doing it. We support events with that, and also the sponsor really like that because next to your finish time uh, on your selfie, the sponsor likes to put a logo there, and then you share it. Sponsor happy, and you're happy too because you have uh, something shared again. Now. So one one last interesting um, development what uh, what I've uh, picked up. Um, it's it's called Ghost Ghost Racer, uh, Ghost Pacer. Sorry. Um, we as a MyLabs have nothing to do with this, but it, yeah, it's really fun to fun to show you uh, this. It's it's not a real product yet, but uh, trying to get backing for this and, and make it work. So you wear glasses, AR glasses, and what you see in the glasses while you're running, you see somebody uh, in this uh, case a, a little a robot kind of person running in front of you. This can be your friend who's also running with these glasses in a different place or a different time. So you can virtually run with somebody else on the track or against Usain Bolt if you want. I wouldn't try that because I'm too slow, but it is possible. So these are interesting new things um, where you use timing data as well and what you as a runner can use to, to become better. Uh, all right, so this was uh, my last slide. I think I stayed nicely within the, the 30 minutes. Um, if you would like to connect with me, you can scan the QR code. That's my LinkedIn uh, address. I'm, I'm happy uh, for that as well. But I'm pretty sure there are also some, some questions uh, left and right that came in. So, yeah, bring them on, I would say. Yeah. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, you were impeccable on the timing. <laughs> so, okay, here's a, here's a warm-up question. <laughs> So, which is your? Uh, you have been to so many races around the world. Which which are your favorite road races? And that's that's really really a hard question to answer. Um, you're right. I've been to a lot of road races, to very special ones, to very small ones. I do not really have one which which is really my my favorite. And uh, but what I do really like, and every time I, I, I'm normally I try to be at the start of the race before the race starts to make sure all the equipment is in order and, and I don't have to do anything normally, but just yeah. that's good for my feeling. And I try to be uh, at the finish. And when I'm at the start, I always have the feeling and I always think I should be running today. Uh, <laughs> so, but there's, there's, there's not really a, a, a favorite race. Uh, it's really interesting to see how small races are organized, how big races are organized and they're all different in a way and they all have their own yeah, nice things and, and, and less good things. Uh, so not, not a favorite. Uh. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, uh, second one, this is from our organizing committee. Uh, a few of the runners are actually pretty enthusiastic about the F1 racing. And uh, since my labs provides technology for that now, I'm guessing that F1 would get the, the most expensive equipment given the uh, most high-tech equipment given the money involved and also the speeds of the cars involved, right? Upwards of 300 kilometers per hour. So what kind of technology gets used there? Yeah, so, so I explained before that there is passive technology and active technology. So okay. the active one is, 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 with a, is with a battery inside. So in the Formula One cars, um, there are two transponders and that's basically because Formula One, uh, yeah, they really want to do that. And that's an active technology. 
And uh, it is almost similar as the, as the car transponders we would uh, put in a normal car. It's, there's not a lot of difference, except that they are a little bit more accurate, uh, but they're also, uh, yeah, it's a special series, so they are much more expensive. So a normal car racing series is, yeah, it's fine, but uh, one, ten, one thousandth of a second is good enough for us. One ten thousand is a little bit overdone. Uh, but if, if, if the higher end racing series want to have that, they can have that, but it's, it's a bit more expensive. Uh, and that's basically because it's, uh, it's more accurate, but also because we're not manufacturing a lot of these. Uh, so technology is, this, is almost the same as with running, but it's the active technology with a battery inside. Uh, right. Right. And so do, do you have the antennas like uh, into the tarmac? Or? Yeah, yeah. So with, with Formula One, they um, uh, because when you watch television, you see a lot of split times and you have, for example, right. also have the DRS system and the DRS is, works also with, with, with the timing system eh? because DRS means when you're very close to the other car within a, a second or something, then they can do uh, press a button in the car and the, the back flap goes a different way to get more downforce. Um, so every every hundred or two hundred meter, they put a wire in the tarmac and they put uh, silicon on top of that, so you don't see it and it doesn't come out. Um, so there is a team of F1 go already two weeks before a race to a circuit, and they take out everything and they put everything again in to make sure it's hundred percent perfect uh, because it's oh, so this is done every race on race every year. I mean, so yeah. Oh, yep. okay. Every circuit. So if they, circuit, if they yeah. go to Singapore, that's on the street, they put it in again. But if they go to Abu Dhabi to a new circuit, they will put in again all these uh, one or two hundred meter loops. Yeah. Because in Formula One, there's one thing super important, and that is the, tele the television. And because they broadcast everything, and people and, and, and television pays quite some money for that, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure because I do not really know the business model. But TV is super important. So they put a lot of money and effort in the cameras and in making sure that the timing is, is, very, is very accurate and, and, and always, always works. Uh, yeah. I think they have four backups there uh, even uh, for timing, which they right. not use, but, but they want to have it. They want to have it, okay. Yeah, so similar on the same lines, what about, I, I see that in one of your slides, you mentioned Giro d'Italia also, that's a premier cycling race, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so how, how is the technology there? Because it goes on for like 3,000 plus kilometers over 21 days. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So there you're not able to put a permanent installation. So you need to have something which, which you can carry. Um, so there the, the loop wire is normally uh, or either in a little mat, uh, which is on the floor. So but we use a wire for that. And also there they use active, uh, active uh, timing technology. Um, they use always a finish line camera as well because with sprints it's super right. close and the transponder is super good. But yeah, they really want to have a visual uh, uh, backup as well. Uh, but they, yeah, they use the same chip as as the ice skating or if you do BMX, uh, then you you use that same chip as well. So there is not really a difference if you cycle the Giro or or the, or the Vuelta or if you uh, race a BMX on your local BMX track, you use the same, you call it pro chip, you use the same chip. Uh, it's also active technology because it needs to be more accurate right. than one tenth of a second. Uh. Right. Yeah, so uh, coming to the, the passive ones that we use in our road races, most of the road races. So there, uh, how about you, uh, how about the accuracy? I mean, say uh, thousands of runners crossing the a particular timing mat and let's say a span of few seconds or, or let's say less than a minute. In, in bigger marathons, right? Like Hong Kong or, or any yeah. other in the world. So is there any issue with that or has the technology evolved to address that? No, so, so when you look at, uh, at the finish line or start line of a big marathon, you always see mats on the floor. And these yeah. mats are, are one meter wide. Right. And when they're one meter wide, then that means that there is a maximum number of people which can pass in a minute, right? Right. Because you cannot have more people in a meter. So if you put four, then you have more people, but then you have four meters. Uh, so what we do, we double that maximum capacity and we make sure that there are no issues, even when you would go with the impossible double number on top of that one meter. Right. Um, so the accuracy is always the same. Um, it's not easy to, to, to do that. Eh? It's, it's when you have a small race, UHF technology, it's not super complicated to, to build a system which works, but it's more complicated when there are a bigger number of people uh, uh, go passing over that, but the accuracy will always stay the same. The accuracy with, with our WebTech system is about one tenth of a second. 
uh, but it doesn't well, matter okay. if it's okay. if it's one or hundred. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Uh, I meant a different thing by accuracy means that none of the runner data should be dropped, right? Let's say uh, every runner should be captured, right? So is there yeah, a certain yeah. kind of drop rate, say one in a million or something like that? No, we, we we say always it's ninety nine point nine or ninety nine point eight percent. Okay. Um, and we try to measure that, but it's super hard to measure because. Um, what I said, eh, for example, people should put a jacket, uh, put the jacket on top of their bib, or they put it at the back, and that is also included in the 99.8%. Uh, so what we uh, what we did when we developed this technology in, in 2008, we put finish line camera, we put a lot of runners with uh, with the bibs and the and the bib tag, we let them all run, and we checked all these results um, with uh, with the results we got out of the bib tag system. And at that moment, of course, we got a super high accuracy. Right. Uh, but it is really depending on what the runner does with it. But yeah, we 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 do know that um, our technology has the has the highest in its industry. And how do we know that? And some of the of the large marathons, uh, like the Boston one and, and some others, they are really testing different brands of, of the products oh, to okay. see because they also they also on television and they also would like to. And they are the high-end races, so for them it's also super important. Yeah. And and another thing, what you see is that nowadays people uh, like to have this, this this tracking thing in in their um, in in an app, which is based on split times. And when you miss people, then the whole tracking doesn't work for them anymore. So it's it's really getting more and more important that with the bigger races, you really catch everybody. Uh, and, and, and that is also why, why our price point is always a bit higher than, uh, than the cheap products from China, for example. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a choice which a running organizer makes. Uh, do you, and, and, and yeah, I, I, I showed you the picture that I was running 10 kilometers a long time ago in, in Hyderabad. I would feel very bad when I would not get a finish time. And I can imagine when you when you train for a marathon. I mean, ten kilometer, everybody can run. I always say a little bit, uh, uh, but but a marathon, you really need to train for that. You cannot wake up this morning and say I run a marathon. So you train for that. You train a year for that, and then you run, and then the organizer cannot give you a finish time. I, I that would be my biggest nightmare, as, especially when you're in timing, of course. Right. So so yeah, super important to to make sure everybody gets uh, gets his finish time. Uh, so there's a question from Rana Sundar. Uh, he says that our squad has been a toughest assignment yet on the timing front. Do you remember any occasion where you had to really actually do the running around to, to get the data together or was it early days or a recent one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I remember some. Um, one was in, uh, in, in, in Singapore where one of the decoders, um, the timer, so we always advise a timer to to bring a spare battery because the, the, there's a battery in the system that has a, a certain uh, lifetime and it, it takes 10 hours or whatever number of hours. And then you can connect a car battery next to it. Uh, uh, and then it can go on until the car battery is empty. But the timer didn't bring a car battery. So yeah. the system was at the last 35 kilometer, battery in the decoder almost empty. So yeah, then we had to run with the decoder which I gave to my, my colleague, it was his first working day. It's a Sashi from the Malaysia office, he still can remember that and tell you that. And he was running with his BitTech decoder, sweating all over the place because yeah, in Singapore at 11 o'clock in the morning, it's very warm. <laughs> it's very warm, yes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah sometimes, uh, but, but it is not necessary. And that is when you time a race, when you prepare it properly uh, and you, you put in some backup mechanisms, then you should not have to stress uh, on it because then you preparation. Uh, I spoke to a timer last week, and and she said preparation is eighty percent of the work of time anyway. Right. If you prepare well, then you have a relaxed day when you time the race. Uh, right. So uh, there's a question from uh, one of our runners, Nagesh. Uh, he wants you to elaborate on the future of the timing technology. And I also had a related question about the GPS because you started your career with a GPS based technology. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. GPS is, is right now in everything. I mean, it's running watches. Yeah, every watch, yeah. So yeah, does it is it coming back to, to timing or any other future enhancements that you are uh, allowed to yeah, discuss? So, 
Yeah. No, 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 yeah, yeah. So I cannot uh, tell everything, of course, uh, yeah. because yeah, some projects are really uh, top secret. Uh, but what I do know is that for the for the motorsports, we will come out with uh, a GPS uh, timing device very soon in in, the, in 2021. Um, and and that uh, that's not for running; it's for it's for motorsports. And and yeah, that is a transponder with a battery where there's GPS in and. Um, yeah, that is going to work uh, based uh, timing with GPS. So yes, that, there are some options, but the thing with the GPS is it needs a battery. And right. for the big running events, if you have to give uh, equipment with a battery to 70,000 people, it's going to be expensive. Yes. Uh, because that you cannot give 70,000 watches to people. Uh, that is, that is, yeah, that is not, not an option. Uh, a, a tag, you, you're talking about a, a couple of dollars. A GPS uh, thing. What were you working on uh, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, you have a, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, 100 euro or more. And so, yes, you can do uh, a, a timing with GPS is uh, an option. It's, it's not super accurate, but there are some tricks to make it more accurate. Right. Um, do you see this for the large running events in the coming two, three years? I think the technology is at this moment too expensive, and you cannot ask all the runners. To buy an expensive watch uh, to run a marathon uh, that is uh, that's not going to happen uh, so but yeah that that is uh, one of the technologies we are really looking into uh, and it's and it's getting better and more accurate uh, in europe is is adding some uh, some galileo satellites uh, for gps uh, technology so yep definitely uh, looking into that yeah so uh, one more uh, more and are interested in the in the future of the technology so yeah <laughs> whatever ah, i understand that uh, yes 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 and 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 there are some some other things which uh, unfortunately i cannot really talk <laughs> too much about but um yeah and the other thing what i explained to you was the two-way uh, communication which we're doing in motorsports i would love to see that also getting in the in the running because you guys are already collecting so much data with, with your watches and heart rate monitors and things like that. Uh, so it would be awesome if you could, um, could bring that together uh, as well. Uh, so on the, on, the, on the other end of this spectrum, uh, there's a very interesting question from Uday is that, uh, is there a cheaper version of the timing technology uh, available or in pipeline, which is uh, applicable to the local club runs where the, the cost is a, is a major factor but yeah, now so, everybody wants a timing yeah so what uh, so our um, our timing systems for the for the for the mass running events are all based on um, disposable technology and actually uh, this year um, yeah, so we we also have this uh, active technology with a reusable chip the pro chip right. and in the past uh, a timing system for that was quite expensive uh, what we've done last year and, and during this, this whole COVID pandemic, uh, we, we, we redesigned this decoder and made it already much cheaper. Uh, so the decoder itself is now, yeah, it's, it's now affordable for every running club. I'm sure about oh, that. Uh, yeah. And the chip is, is not as cheap as the disposable chip, but you can reuse it every time. So you can use it multiple times. So then when you calculate it, if you have every week a running event, and then, it, then it's already becoming more interesting. Yeah. What we what we do in uh, in some sports like ice skating or like BMX racing, then um, we tell the participant, okay, if you want to participate in this race, you have to bring your own chip, um, which is um, yeah for the for the participant uh, an investment, but for the for the running club or the BMX club or the or the ice skating club. They only have to buy this this one machine, and then the, the runner brings that chip themselves, uh, which is easy with registration because you already have that chip number, and it's it's also cheaper for the for the for the club. Uh, right. So so we we do offer uh, those kind of systems, and especially during this 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 COVID pandemic, we see that that the interest of that is is increasing because yes, the smaller races you see that starting up everywhere. It's only the large races which cannot take place because of the the, yeah, the infectious spread and things like that. Uh, yeah, there's on, also one more thing I would like to like uh, follow up question on this one. Yeah. So already uh, we see that the big city running events uh, they generate a lot of trash, right? Yes. And uh, and disposable bib tag is really is, is also one of the factors there. So yeah, what you mentioned trash. is actually pretty pretty interest, interesting. Is that reusable chip would kind of help in some way mitigating. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I uh, you also mentioned that Berlin uses a, dis uh, a reusable, reusable chip axle, right? Yes. Even yes. Comrades is doing that. 
So yeah. do you see this kind of again making a big comeback with the decoder prices getting cheaper and? Uh, yeah, I, I think re reusable chips are, are, are super interesting, um, but I think for the large running events, it is really a hassle because and those, uh, for example, the Berlin chip, I think it's like 30 euros. So if you run a 10 kilometer one time and you have to pay 30 euros for a chip, right. that is a lot of money, I think. Uh, but it, you can reuse it, but if you only run one time. So that basically means that the event organizer also needs to have uh, chips for all those people who do not want to buy the chip. And that means that he needs to get them all back. And that is, the, the, that is why we went to the disposable technology and because we didn't want to take back all these chips because these people are finishing and they right. need to leave the finish area as soon as possible. Right. However, as, as saying that, uh, the, the chip which is at this moment on your on your bib, uh, first of all, a lot of people, they keep the bib. I'm not sure how that's about you, right. but this bib for the Hyderabad uh, run I did, I'm pretty sure I packed it already in the box, uh, but I'm pretty sure I still have it because I'm proud of that. I, I keep the bib, I keep the medal, it's it's I did that I want to show that a bit and it's it's a good memory of that so I keep the chip I, I do not throw it away but would you be a throw it away then you can just throw it away with the normal trash there are not uh, a, a lot of heavy metals in it it's it's not there's no battery inside uh, but we are also looking into into yeah a, a proper options for that as well uh, of course uh, because we do realize uh, that the, you see in in running that the plastic bottles and the caps and the amount of, 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 of waste generated in a running event is massive. It's, it's really a lot. Uh, but a lot of running events are also really looking into that. Uh, so that's, that's good to hear. So yes, we are looking into those kind of uh, things as well. Yeah. You can throw away uh, your bib with the chip um, without uh, having a big impact on the environment. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good to know. So there's one more question from Shiva. Uh, so what are the main areas where MyLabs is focused on developing a technology on, say, catching the cheaters in a road race? Yeah, that the cheaters is always an interesting, an interesting one. Um, so what, uh, what the, 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 the bigger events are doing is they put uh, more timelines at the places where you could cheat. Right. So what the timer then does is when this, all this data comes in, and you registered for the marathon and you didn't pass the first point, you didn't win the marathon and it disqualify you. Uh, <coughs> so that is uh, basically what we, uh, yeah, how we try to help them is uh, making sure that they add some more timelines to, to, to catch those cheaters. Uh, and that is yeah, the, one of the things you can do, but there will always be uh, people who want to cheat and they will always find ways to, to do that, unfortunately. Uh, and the timer tries to find good ways to, to catch them. So I, I remember one of the races uh, here in Malaysia where a veteran person uh, won the race. And that, no, that was in the Maldives. That's even a better example. So we were timing a race in the Maldives. First event they were timing. They were at the stage at the veterans and there was a 16 year old boy on the second place. And it really ended almost up at, the, at the, the, the timing then at the finish, because of course this person could not have won uh, in the veterans category because he was only 16, but he ran with the bib of his father. Right. The timing system does not see that because the timing system says the bib 10 is a veteran because you registered like that. Uh, so yes, there's always a human factor involved and, and this specific race, a really nice race in, in the Maldives. The next year they checked, of course, the ID of the person when before the price giving. So they learned something from that. <laughs> but yeah, so it gets the, the cheaters. I think it's always a, a little bit of a, of a game. Personally, I do not really understand why you do that. But uh, yeah, that's personally, I know there are a lot of people, there are people who, who try to, uh, to, to cut off. And, and sometimes it's also not, not on purpose. Huh? I mean, you want to run a race, your friend gets injured, or your, your, your father or mother or whatever, and you, or your, your wife, you take her a bit, you run. That's not really on purpose. Uh, but okay. yeah, people also don't realize that. Uh, when I take the bib of my wife, I might end up on the podium uh, as a second uh, <laughs> wife running. Uh. Yeah. So but with split points, you can do a lot. Uh, with photographs, you can do a lot. So some large marathons, they, they check the the photos afterwards. So when somebody finished, they take photos. And then when he comes to collect the prize, they check if the photo is the same. 
Right. Uh, that These has happened some... to, to yeah, few runners I know that they ran on somebody else's bib and got yeah, disbarred. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So there are always yeah. people who try to do that. And yeah, I, I don't believe in that. And it, it, it very often comes out as well. Yeah. So last, I mean, we are almost at the end. Uh, there are a yeah. couple of questions left. I'll, I'll club two questions from Anand and Prabhat. So Prabhat asked that in this day of virtual races, some companies are asking runners to use their own app. Probably MyLabs also has something like that. Uh, some of the events he's saying are not showing proper finish timings even after runner has finished. And then as a follow-up, mm -hmm. Anand asked that uh, sometimes different, uh, a lot of different GPS watches will show different timings. Uh, what could be the reason? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so th 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 in this in this COVID time, uh, you see a lot of creative companies who are, um, yeah, popping up with all these virtual runs. Um, first of all, I'm really wondering is after this COVID time if, if they really uh, stay for a long time because I believe people really want to go to an event and run and taste the atmosphere. And, but it's really a good way to to train. And and what you see there is that GPS is not so accurate. Uh, I, I did it myself together with, with somebody else. We both ran 10 kilometer. His watch said 9.8, my said 10.2. Right. And we both used uh, a, a different, the same app with a different uh, phone. And so it's, it's, it's really, uh, when you really want to do competitive running with that, that is almost impossible, uh, I think, uh, because it's not that accurate. Uh, and when you run in a city, you have all these high buildings. These GPS uh, uh, watches, they go all the way everywhere very often. It's a bit depending on the watch you have and the, and the, and the app you use. Um, so that is also why when we do timing, everybody needs to use this same chip. Same chip. And, and, and that if you, if you would say, okay, you can all submit your watch time, then you will really get problems with that. Uh, right. And that's what you see now happening with these, with these VR races. So yes, it is really cool that we can, can run the race and, and put something there, but to really make official top 10 and put big price money on it. Uh, I don't, personally, I don't really believe that's super fair unless you all use the same, uh, the same app or the same, the same technology. Um, we, um, we, had, uh, we, we have this event app and we also, uh, when COVID started, we added a little bit for VR and we said, okay, to our customers, you can use this, please get some uh, events on board with this because we also feel very bad about this COVID. And then we introduced um, some GPS uh, part in that, uh, but we really took it out very quickly because uh, as you said, a lot of inaccuracy, people complaining about it and we couldn't get it, uh, get it right as we would like to have it. And yeah, we have a, a brand name iLabs we want to be super, super good. So we said, okay, don't let's don't do it in this way. So now we're back into the, the old way that you, uh, you record the time yourself and you send in the proof of it oh, okay. to the to the to the event, uh, like a GPX file or a Garmin thing. Or, so yeah, there are a lot of different technologies. Uh, do you can you get a super accurate result? Uh, I don't believe at this moment. But hey, who knows? In in a few, in a few years, hopefully we don't need it. But maybe in a few years that uh, that is possible. Uh, right. But at this moment, I don't see it super accurate. Uh, yeah. Uh, l really, last question. <laughs> yeah, no, no really? problem. Yeah, it's good. So, it's all very good, valid questions and very nice yeah. ones, which all are about timing. So I really like. So it, uh, will the will the environmental conditions have an effect on the timing calculations? Say the humidity in the air, uh, or the high altitude, or anything that UHF is affected by? Uh, a water, what I said, but then you right. really have to put it in the middle of a glass water. Oh, okay. and, and one time we had an event in, in Lebanon where uh, there was like a flooding and then all the timing mats flooded away. They stopped the race oh. as well. So nobody wants to run in that condition anyway. Right, anyway. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yes, that can affect the timing, but, but normally there's not a lot. And that, of course, the systems are specified uh, from certain temperatures to certain uh, temperatures uh, minus uh, to plus. And if you put them in the full sun for a long, long time, then uh, it's really better to put an umbrella on top of it. Um, right. But it will not affect the accuracy. It will only affect the, that the system will give a warning. And if it's really too hot, but then uh, you put it in the desert with full sun on it, then it will give a warning and say, hey, I really am too, getting too hot. Please cool me down or I'm going to switch off and then it will switch off. But you get a lot of, as a timer, you get a lot of warnings on that. And because yeah, our systems are, are used also on these races on the Antarctic where it's super cold. 
and they are used in in, in the desert in uh, actually in in the UAE there are a lot of races at this moment going on because they start allowing races again and these are very often in the desert and that is not a problem for the timing itself uh, but the equipment uh, yeah you need to stay within this in the specifications of the equipment right right so Raymond, thank you thanks a lot you've been very very good with the question answers very patient so uh, yeah. over to you Swati now interesting and quite informative. Uh, we have a few takeaways from today's talk. Uh, number one would be the timing is important for competitive events that involve racing and also to individuals who love running. From here, knowing the time through a stopwatch to capturing of time and associated progress in this field is enormous. My labs has played a pioneering role in this field and they are instrumental in keeping runners like us motivated by giving us instant and interesting feedbacks. So special, which was very informative and how it will improve the whole experience of our running. And thank you so much, Mr. Raymond, for this valuable inputs. Our deepest gratitude for taking the time out and sharing your experience and learning with us today. And to our audience, thank you for spending time with us today. The recording of this event will be available on our Hyderabad Runners Facebook as well as the ATL Hyderabad YouTube page. Please come back to watch us who can benefit from it. And please do not forget to hashtag Hyderabad Runners and hashtag also beyond the track. We'll be back next Saturday at the same time and yet with another expert and yet another interesting topic for you. Until then, this is Swati Mahanti from Hyderabad Runners signing off. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye.